This morning I wanted to share with you about signature. You know, that it's needed to validate and authorize contracts or statements or laws. And when you sign on there, it defines and declares your choice. I want this morning to let you listen for a moment to a, a song clip of a, a group that this kind of became a signature song for them, but it has truths that we need to consider. You, you may have heard that song from Charlie Daniels' band, but I, I want you to, to consider the, the truth that there are a lot of false and erroneous notions about how people lose their soul. Do you have to literally sign a contract with the devil? Or do you have to commit some kind of unpardonable sin or do something that brings God's eternal wrath, judgment on you? Some people think that way. And so I want us to, to look to Scripture because the Scripture is full, really, from one end to the other, of accounts of God's judgment on different people, different places, different times. And sometimes it was for total annihilation. Just, I'm done. Your rebellion has gone on as far as God is going to allow. He just cut it off. The flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, and the list goes on. But that's not the only reason or purpose for God's judgment. And the more we look at this, the Bible shows a, a completely different reason and purpose for God's judgment. And if we don't learn and understand this, we're never really going to know God or His ways. If we don't learn about God's judgment and some of the parts and plans of it, we are never going to really know God or His ways. So first off, let's just clarify the issue that most of the bad things that happen in this world, it isn't God's judgment, and it isn't the attack of the devil either. It's just suffering caused by people who signed on to foolish and selfish choices without knowledge or care of the results, because God has given humanity free will. Now that's another doctrine that's deserving of more time than we have this morning, so we're not going to go there to look at God giving us free will, but He certainly has. God lets people choose disastrous things that affect them and others with horrible consequences. So that's most of what causes the suffering and all those things that take place. But the Bible's redundant in accounts of God bringing judgment throughout history on people to accomplish God's plans and purposes. So let's uh, look at some of the things the Bible says about this. And, and I want us to, to first to note and compare some of the false notions that people have and Scripture addresses some of these things. And so, I want us to look at Psalm 50. And I want us to look at verses 16 through 22 as, as one of these false notions is being addressed. But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to declare my statues or take my covenant in your mouth? seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you. When you saw a thief, you consented with him and have been partaker with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes." 
Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. So from this portion of scripture, we see some tendencies of, of humanity. The first is to, to forget God's omniscience. The fact that he sees and knows all. There's nothing hidden from him. And the second is, is to have a disregard for God's holiness. That somehow think that God just overlooks, doesn't care about sin. From God's declaration of these things, it should shake people back to reality when we read about the fact that God knows and he will respond according to his holy justice. Another erroneous notion is to somehow conclude that, well, that you can somehow escape God's judgment. The prophet Amos, speaking of the coming judgment, Amos 5.19 said, It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Or as though he went into the house, leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. In other words, you're not going to escape what's, what's coming. And, you know, some people get pretty clever trying to escape what they know is, is probably coming their way. I want us to, to look at Old Testament accounts found in 1 Kings 18. It's about King Ahab. Now, you have to remember, King Ahab was the most wicked king in his day. He, he was progressively and far away more wicked than all that had preceded him. And he had all these prophets, the false prophets and the prophet of the Lord. And before he went to battle, he consulted them. But, and King Jehoshaphat, who was with him, the king of Judah, said, well, don't you have a prophet of the Lord? And he said, yeah, but I hate him. He always says negative things about me. Matter of fact, I threw him in jail. And so they go get him, and, and they, they ask him about it. And again, he, he, he declares that um, all these other guys, a, a lying spirit's been in them. And, and so as we get to 18, verse 27, But Micaiah said, If you ever return in peace... The Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, take heed, all you people. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle, but you put on your robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself, and they went into battle. Now the king of Syria had commanded the captains of the chariots who were with him, saying, fight with no one, small or great, but only with the king of Israel. So it was when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat that they said, It's the king of Israel. Therefore they surrounded him to attack. But Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him, and God diverted them from him. So it was when the captains of the chariots saw that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back from pursuing him. Now a certain man drew a bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. So he said to the driver of his chariot, Turn around and take me out of the battle, for I am wounded. The battle increased that day, and the king of Israel propped himself up in his chariot, facing the Syrians until evening. And about the time of sunset, he died. For all of his conniving, all of his trying to, to hide and, and, and somehow make it through this, an arrow at random went between the joints of his armor. Judgment came upon him. So, some of these things that we need to consider is, it's a false notion to think that God doesn't know about or care about sin. It's also a false, false notion to think that we can somehow cleverly escape his judgment. Both of these things are failing conclusions. When we consider that the fact that God can, at any instant, annihilate the wicked, any moment he chooses. So knowing that, 
If punitive destruction was all he wanted, well, it would have been done a long time ago. It would already be over. If that's all he wanted, I mean, he can, it's done. So we have to consider there's got to be more to this. And as we look at the Old Testament prophet Amos, and he prophesied God's judgment on different foreign nations and also on his own people. And, and so I want us to, to look at what he says about that because in, in the midst of this, he explains a truth to us that we need to understand about purpose of judgment. When we look at Amos 4 and we look at verses 6 through 11, also, I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I also withheld rain from you when there were still three months to the harvest. I made it rain on one city. I withheld rain from another city. One part was rained upon, and where it did not rain, the part withered. So two or three cities wandered to another city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I blasted you with blight and mildew when your gardens increased, your vineyards, your fig trees, your olive trees, the locusts devoured them. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I set among you a plague after the manner of Egypt. Your young men I killed with a sword. Along with your captive horses, I made the stench of your camps come up into your nostrils. Yet you have not returned to me says the Lord. I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you are like a firebrand plucked from the burning, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Did you connect the dots? Yet you have not returned to me. That was the purpose of all this, was return to me. God wanted his people to turn back to him. And this concept of people turning to God is repeated several times and in different ways in the 107th Psalm. I want us to, to look at this and catch this. Um, this is a psalm of, of praising God, but it has this repetition that goes on throughout it, and so I want us to look at it at verses 4 through 6. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. When we look at verses 10 through 14, those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and irons, because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High, Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down. There was none to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their chains in pieces. 17 through 21. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all manner of food. They drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. <clears throat> As we look at verses 27 and 28, they reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man or with their wits in. They cry out to the Lord in their trouble, and he, just, and he brings them out of their distresses. He calms the storm so the waves are still. All of these things happen, and eventually they cry out to the Lord. They recognize they need God. Now, there's an obvious pattern going on here, but when we get to the very last verse of this psalm, it says, whoever is wise will observe these things. And they will understand the loving kindness of the Lord. So we see these things that look horrible, look like sure destruction. We see these things, but their purpose is God's loving kindness. 
to cause people to cry out to him, to turn to him. Now, I know this is Old Testament, but if we go to the New Testament and we look there for clarity and and we listen to the Apostle Peter in a letter that happened to be his last letter. He knew it would be his last letter. He wrote right in it, the Lord has showed me my time has come. And in it, he's writing about judgment. He's writing about past judgment. He's writing about future judgment. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, he says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Did you catch that word, long-suffering? So we see that in in these times of judgment, we see the Lord is showing loving kindness, that he's long-suffering, and he's desiring repentance. And so that we can see the, the power in repentance, the power of that response. I want us to go to the Old Testament book of Jonah, and as we go there, I want, want us to consider, you know, the, there was a reason Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh. Remember Jonah, the Lord said, go there and preach. And Jonah said, uh-uh. And he went and got on a boat. And then there was a storm. And everybody's wondering, well, pray. And Jonah says, no, it's me. Throw me out. And they do. And he's in the belly of a great fish for three days and changes his mind. But there's a reason he didn't want to go. And it doesn't tell you in the book. It doesn't tell you in the book of Jonah why. But history tells us why. Because when you study these people and you study Nineveh and you study that this was a kingdom that their whole economy was fueled and driven by plundering other people. And they were absolutely wicked and cruel. Since the kids are out of here, I can tell you that some of the things they did, they'd take leading, the leading people of the city or whatever, they'd take them right out in front of the city, stake them down to the ground, skin them alive. That's the kind of things they did. That's just a very small part of the graphic things that they did. There's a reason Jonah did not want to go. He didn't want them to hear the message, 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Because he didn't want them to have the chance. He did not want them to have the chance of repentance. When we read chapter 3, verses 6 through 10, this is after Jonah comes and declares 40 days. Nineveh shall be overthrown. It comes to the king. And the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violent that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works, that they had turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he said that he would bring upon them. He did not do it. And as he's dealing with Jonah later, we look at the last verse, chapter 4, verse 11. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and much livestock? Did you catch that word, should I not pity? In the midst of judgment, we see loving kindness, long-suffering, Pity. God's holiness demands justice. 
But God's love desires mercy. That's God has loving kindness, long suffering, and pity, even as he's faced with judgment. And that's what brought Jesus here. That's what brought Jesus here because Jesus is the only one that could make atonement for God's holy justice. Jesus was sinless, but Jesus was merciful, just like God. Jesus taught something about repentance, about the necessity of it. And, and there's something for us to learn here in Luke 13, as Jesus is teaching about the necessity of repentance. It's thir Luke 13, the first five verses. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He's dealing with this human tendency that we all face. We like to group people. And we like to group some people as these are good people. And these are, well, these are wicked people. They're worse. They're worse. They're, they, they've signed on to sin, and they deserve judgment. Now, I won't ask for a show of hands, because mine would be right up there, too. This is a human tendency. We, we fall for this. It, we think there's people, well, they signed on to sin. They're, they're worthy of what they get. And then there's these, group, these other people that are good people, and, well, they deserve mercy. But God doesn't see it that way. Jesus said, unless you repent, you all likewise perish. So the bottom line of it is, everyone who fails to repent and by faith accept Christ's forgiveness is not going to have their name signed in the Lamb's Book of Life. It only gets there by repentance and accepting Christ by faith. Now, I've been sharing about a lot of things, and I, I know that this whole idea of God judging people is a real struggle for some. Matter of fact, they're asking continually, how could a good God judge people? Well, the fact of it is, it, it really only makes sense when we consider eternity. If you don't consider eternity, it isn't going to make sense. But when you consider the fact there's eternal life and God's blessing for eternity versus eternal separation from God and none of his goodness for eternity, then there's a whole new value to things. And we have to ask a question. What if this judgment, these bad things, what if that's the only thing that will nudge people closer to repentance and a willingness to surrender to Christ? What if those, that judgment's the only thing that's going to nudge them towards repentance and surrender to Christ? I want you to listen to a man that he was making his own choices, he was signing on to his own things in life, but the judgment of the state brought him to a nudge closer. What if he had never got the nudge? What if he had never got the nudge? You see, Jesus asked a very profound question that everyone needs to consider. It's found in Matthew 16, verse 26. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? 
Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So we're challenged. Are, are we signed on? Are we signed on in agreement with the Lord? Yes, Lord, bring whatever it takes to bring people to you. Bring whatever it takes to bring people to you in our family, in our community, in our nation. Are we signed on with, yes, Lord, bring whatever it takes. And so I've shared all these things with you this morning to, to ask a few questions. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, the biggest question I can ask is, are you ready to accept Christ? Do you recognize that you need his forgiveness? You need his abundant and eternal life. But the only way you're going to get it is to repent and to ask him through faith. Ask him to forgive you and accept him as your Lord and Savior. Maybe there's someone who wants to do that or know, know more about it. If that's you, just raise your hand. And maybe some of you have had some notions about God's judgment that, that aren't biblical. Maybe some of you have been struggling with just the whole idea of it. I, I hope that you can see God's judgment really includes loving kindness, long suffering, and pity, even in the middle of all that. And maybe some of us just need to say, Lord, help me to give up my way of assessing people as these people are good and these people are worse. I have to raise my hand to that one. Lord, help me to see more clearly that everyone needs to return to you. Everyone needs to repent. And maybe some of you along with me would, would be willing to sign on to, Lord, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to nudge people to you, Lord, those in my family, those in this community, those in this nation. Because until we sign on to that, we're really not going to be all that useful or effective for his kingdom, for him. We've got to sign on to that, Lord, whatever it takes. So, Father, I pray, Lord, deal with us this, this day. All of us, Lord, in these different areas, Lord, that apply to us as individuals. Deal with us as a father with his children. Lord, and help us, Lord, to understand you and your ways better. I ask and I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May God bless you and keep you.